Welcome to Swimming with Alligators, the VC podcast from the LP perspective, with your hosts, Alexa Benz and Ernest Sweat. You ready? Let's dive in. Today on Swimming with Alligators, we have the pleasure of speaking with Eric Sippel, a philanthropist and investor uh, with his family office called Sippel Farb Family Office. Um, Eric started his career as a private equity and hedge fund lawyer before moving into the investment side. He's personally backed over 50 emerging managers and serves as an informal advisor to the venture private equity and real estate funds in which he invests. Eric, it's a pleasure to uh, have you on Swimming with Alligators. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want to first start off with on the Full Ratchet uh, podcast, uh, which I am a fan of and love. Uh, you told Nick the first thing a VC should do when given a chance to speak with an LP is to ask them questions. So we're going to actually take that to heart. So tell tell us about who you are um, and what GPO, GPs should know about you. So I'm the luckiest man in the world. If you thought about the probability, if you looked at me growing up, uh, that I would end up here, it's infinitesimal. So I live every day like it's a gift and I'm just, I'm just really happy to be here. I, um, as you said, I started my career as a private equity and hedge fund lawyer, moved over and became the chief operating officer of what became a multi-billion dollar hedge fund firm. Uh, or I was, I co-led our venture practice at that firm and it was probably bottom decile. So I have lots of lessons that I've learned <laughs> along the way. Thankfully, we invested a tiny, tiny portion of our partner's capital into the venture space. And so we didn't actually lose them very much money. And But still. Uh, then I left. Uh, we shut down our firm. And now I'm running my family office. And uh, I focus on emerging managers. And I focus on acting as a coach or a sounding board or a mentor to those managers. And I'm curious if there are so, probably yeah. plenty of lessons learned, but are there any stories you can share from that bottom decile? Like what, what's the, we don't have many examples of people who are willing to come on and share what wasn't working. So I think the reason why we were bottom decile is that we didn't, yeah. We invested very opportunistically when a deal came across our way that we thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. That'll marry with some of the things that we're seeing out there in the public sphere. The question we never asked is, why is this deal coming to us? Hmm. Why is this deal not coming to experienced venture capitalists? And so, and when we look back at, or when I look back at all of the different investments we made, we probably made four or five. Um, they each shared the characteristic of something that now I know, oh, a, an experienced venture capitalist wouldn't have done that. But of course, at the time, we weren't experienced venture capitalists. And so we made all of those mistakes ourselves. I want to take a step back. Eric, what made an, a, a lawyer want to dig into this asset class and then after some bumps and bruises, still continue to like learn about it. I got to the place where I was so burnt out from practicing law that I wanted to really de-stress my life, get rid of my stress and reduce the hours. And that all happened. But along the way, what's driven me is sort of what I would say is intellectual curiosity. And so the other part about the practice of law and particularly in retrospect, is it's pretty much the same thing all the time. And it's the, you know, the clients are slightly different. The solutions are slightly different, but it's all pretty similar. Whereas investing is just, you know, the, the vast differences across businesses and asset classes, there's always something new to learn. And so that's really what's driven me is to, it's that intellectual curiosity. It's the, this is what's new to learn. All of that sounds like a very daunting task when you mention the dispersion in comparison to even like private equity, real estate, other asset, even other private asset classes. How the hell is someone who's new 
to being an allocator within this space, where do they even start? I think it's really hard to be new as an LP allocator into the space. And so I, I hate to be defeatist about it. So I'll come up with an answer that I think, you know, how do you start? Because I think people can start. I, and so maybe I take back my defeatist comment. I think people lean, need to lean into their previous experience and skill set. Mm. And so for me, I have been working with uh, alternative, in the alternative asset class my entire 38-year career. I started investing in venture funds just in my clients when I was practicing law 25 years ago. So, so, I've, seen a re, uh, so I've seen a lot, but when I started my family office about 14 years ago, what I, what I looked inside of myself and I says, what am I really good at? And one of the things I'm good at is helping other managers. Like I've been doing that my entire career. Uh, and so that was where I started because that was work for me. It was like, what could I bring to the table to help other GPs that they didn't otherwise have? If you're an LP and you want to get involved in the venture space and you're willing to spend some time, and I, I recognize most people aren't going to spend 90% of their time. Um, but if you're willing to spend some time, I, I just say, look inside me. It's like, all right, why, why am I here? What can I bring to the table? How can I help? And then, and, and what do I know? And lean into those strengths. And then over time, the longer you're inside of an ecosystem, the more you learn from it. But you have to sort of earn your way into the ecosystem. You know, example, a manager comes to me and said, you know, I was put together with this other GP, but it's not working. How do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. And so to help him through the divorce proceedings or another manager, uh, you know, I, I will help them and say, you're not leaning into your superpowers. What are your superpowers? What makes you really good? And when you go out and communicate your message to the world, you need to communicate how your fund fits who you are and your superpowers. And so that's another example. Uh, I will often make introductions to other potential LPs, uh, to other GPs, to portfolio companies where they may invest. So, you know, sort of using my network. Uh, those are some of the many examples. Another example is a GP where I feel like their follow-on strategy isn't really optimal. And we'll have a conversation around what their follow-on strategy is or their portfolio construction. Uh, just like anything you can think of that is not invest in this company, but rather the rest of running a venture capital firm, those are the things I get involved with. When I kind of want to switch gears to how managers develop a relationship with you and your rubric for selection. Um, but first, since you've seen so many you know, fundraising decks, what is differentiation today? I'm going to go back to something I just said, and I wouldn't know if I would call it differentiation or just critical in explaining the story, which I think then gets differentiation because every GP is unique. They bring their own unique set of experiences to the table. And the great thing about this asset class and also the very hard thing about this asset class is that they're, most of the GPs, if not all of them, are very talented. So... What brings differentiation is understanding what your superpowers are to design a fund around your superpowers. So your superpower may be that you have spent 25 years in the supply chain and logistics. And so, and you have a very deep industry network into the, that industry. So that's a superpower. And so your fund is designed around it. It might focus just on supply chain. But then sort of what your experiences are within the industry and has that relate, whether it's not just your network, but your, your sort of insights and the like. And designing your firm and your fund around that experience 
And then communicating that experience, because this is the mistake that most emerging managers make, is they're not very good at underst both understanding the superpower of designing around, but then communicating that. They often design around it, but communicating that to their prospective and current investors. And so that's what I think creates differentiation is understanding your superpower, designing around it and communicating. Where does that leave a new generalist? Because the assumption there is that like people, the example you gave, which was sounded like a lot of, I think our mutual friend Santosh uh, and his, mm -hmm. his group um, mm -hmm. at Dynamo, but there's definitely been a, a, an emergence of verticalized firms Mm -hmm. Yet we still see a, a place for generalists. Mm -hmm. Where do the what does that leave generalists? So I'm going to answer the question two ways. One is what I look for, and the other is to answer your question. Okay. I way prefer specials over generals. Okay. So, so where that leaves with me is it's very hard to get in my portfolio as generals. I have some generalists in my portfolio, um, but it's hard. And and by the way. When I say specialist, I don't just mean industry or sector specialist. It could be, you could be focused on helping immigrant founders. Mm -hmm. You could be a deep tech specialist. You could be a specialist in investing in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, so there are spe a regional specialists. So there are specialists that I think are more than, um, than just industry, mm -hmm. but that there, there is room there are a lot of very strong generalists, emerging managers, established managers, and they will, and many of them will continue to succeed. So where does it leave them? They still have superpowers. They may not be industry specific superpowers. So a, a superpower could be they're particularly good at rolling up their sleeves and getting a company from zero to 1 million revenue. And they are particularly good at helping a founder craft their marketing story. That's an example. Um, they may be particularly good at strategy. They could have come from a consulting background way back when. Uh, they could just be particularly good at empathy. They were founders themselves and know the journey that founders go on. And just they're the first call. They're the ones that are there. Um, yeah, they, yeah, they, they could be, there's just so many different examples of generalists and how they can really, they really can have superpowers. They could be particularly insightful on um, knowing when a company is about to break out. Mm. Uh, you know, there's one generalist that I'm an investor with, Zach Coleus, who's amazing. And he is particularly good at knowing when those companies are going to break out and when they found product market fit. And that's his superpower. And mm. that's what he invests in. And his, his results are truly outstanding. And he was, he was a founder for uh, you know, many, many years and has been an investor for many years. And he's got, a, you know, there's a lot there, but there's true superpowers even though he's a generalist. Your viewpoint on kind of high conviction, high concentration of a portfolio and large ownership that could have been lost in this last, I think we're calling it zero moment, right? Um, zero interest rate period. How do you judge fund, new fund or fund managers that you're just meeting or you're developing a relationship with that, you know, came up in that moment? So I allocated to a lot of um, managers new to me during that cert moment and combination of being lucky and looking at the things that I'm about to describe, I'd say that virtually all of the managers I allocated to during that moment and the ones before and since all sort of share the following characteristics. Number one, I am looking for managers that are relatively sober. Mm. Uh, I, uh, one of the aspects of my rubric is a GP who has had at least five years of operating experience 
and at least and, and a GP could be the same person, at least five years of investing other people's money in the same kind of way they're investing my money, whether that's mm. uh, working at another venture firm, syndicates, uh, things, uh, corporate VC, various different ways. And what that has led to is GPs, and this is, and so this is how I would I judge GPs now, both the ones I invested in and new ones, GPs that did not write a lot of checks when everyone else was writing a lot of checks. They, they sort of kept their pacing steady along the way. Not more than, not less than, just sort of steady. Sometimes less if evaluations were too crazy in their space. That's number one. Number two, uh, GPs that really tried to persuade their portfolio companies not to take these crazy inflated valuation rounds with massive amounts of capital. And if they were to do that, to really encourage those founders to not spend capital quickly. So to have a, so if they were going to take large amounts of money, just extend the runway as opposed to be capital inefficient. That was something I was looking at then and I'm looking at now. Uh, the thing, the question I ask that is the first one of the first questions I ask, and that immediately helps me distinguish whether I'm interested or not, is the question, how long between typically between the time you meet a founder until the time that you write a first check? That is my go-to question. When people and, and it's and it's asked in a very neutral way. And by the way, it's it's horrible that I'm outing myself here on this podcast because now other GPs who listen are going to not answer it the same way <laughs> that they might have otherwise answered it. So, um, but that's okay. When they, you know, dur during that ZERP moment, most GPs would answer, I can move really fast when I need to. Uh, I need a founder and that's the first words out of their mouth. And that's immediately, it doesn't matter what really fast is after that. I'm done. Mm. I'm not interested. So really fast could be, I could do it in a day. Really, really not interested. I could do it in two weeks. I'm still not interested. If, if what they're focused on is speed, I'm not interested. If what they're focused on is finding the right founder GP fit, because it's a long marriage that you're working really closely with and you can't fire the GP and you basically can't fire the founder. Mm -hmm. And so making sure there's a real good fit. Now, sector specialists or specialists generally can move quicker. So because they are, they bring a prepared mind. And so they can move in three, four weeks. But the, the answer out of their mouth is not, I can move really quickly. I can do it in three weeks. The answer is I bring a prepared mind three weeks. If I really come in knowing that this is a, this is a problem that I've spent many months working on the problem. That made me think of that first criteria, that portion you're speaking to a lot of people went to speed because you know, it's one thing finding sourcing. The other part is about being a fund manager is winning. And Absolutely. so their only, their only approach it to, to winning is to actually, you know, speed. If you are not a fan of that, when it comes to the winning bucket, what attributes are you looking for? So part of my rubric is the three S's sourcing, selection, and stewardship. Most people triple click, most LPs triple click on sourcing. What does the network look like and the like? For me, when I am choosing, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that that's not really important. It's vitally important. But me sitting in the seat that I'm sitting in, I think that's very difficult to distinguish among GPs who has the strongest network. Because not only is it who's linked into who, but it's also, if I were to, ping you, I might not be the first person, you, you may not respond to me within 15 minutes. On the other hand, if I were to ping somebody else, 
let's say we're Pink Santosh as an example, you mentioned him, he will respond to me within 15 minutes because we have a really strong relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just the breadth of the relationship, it's the depth of the relationship. And you can't measure that sitting in my seat. It's vitally important, but you can't measure it. What you can measure is stewardship. How much value to GPs add to their founders. You can see what they're doing. You can ask them to describe situations. You can dig underneath that. You can talk to founders and find out if that was real. You can ask those founders about other GPs on their cap table and how they've helped them to really calibrate. You could talk to other GPs about it. So you can really investigate stewardship. And by the way, stewardship, I think more is what predicts depth of network, not breadth of network, but depth of network. It predicts how likely it is that a founder is going to take your capital. Because if you've been extremely helpful, if you introduced 80% of the revenue for the first year and a half to a company, guess what? That founder is going to do anything in the world for you. And if, particularly if you've done that for every founder, you know, you've made massive introductions for every founder. And so guess what? When a potential company comes to a GP and says, hey, what should I know about you? They immediately send them over to those founders. Those founders absolutely rave. And they win the deal. And those GPs have a, are able to talk with the founder and say, hey, look, you don't want you can wait an extra three or four weeks mm. to see if this is going to work, to find the right GP founder fit. The money is going to be there. And so, yes, winning is really important, but I think you win from stewardship. In venture, there is never a bad time to invest. You should invest through cycles evenly because we're talking about the future and we're not just talking, particularly if you're talking early stage, seed, A, because those businesses take for seven to 12 years to exit. And so much has to happen in terms of follow on rounds of financing and where the world is going that. There's no one right time or good time or bad time to invest in venture. Now, after the fact, of course, you can look at vintages and say, oh, that was a bad vintage. That's a good vintage. But yeah. that's after the fact. That doesn't count. That's resulting. So partly, part of my rubric is I'm looking for areas where there is a mismatch between capital and opportunity. Hmm. And so... Uh, you know, as an example, uh, I have been excited for the last seven years in hard science, non-digital, non-software science coming at us being spun out of universities where mm -hmm. the federal government has basically, uh, you know, paid for technology development for 10 years and now it's ready for commercialization. That's an area, and it's a firm, Rhapsody Ventures, where I'm on their LPAC, that I, 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 is one of my favorite funds, uh, investing in exactly, exactly that. Uh, more generally, I am always excited in deep tech. I feel like investing in areas where you don't have a technology advantage is way, and, it's, and you're really focused on execution is much, much harder than where you have a real technology advantage. So I'm really interested in that. I continue to believe that immigrants are not receiving the level of capital that they should be receiving. So as an example of funds, Unshackled Ventures, um, another example is Foothill Ventures, which invests in uh, primarily in immigrant PhDs uh, in the deep tech space. Uh, so those are some of the areas that I find particularly exciting. Yeah, you're the second uh, guest, uh, LP guest, who's mentioned the university's uh, spin out. So it's Chris from Ahoy Capital. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so Chris, and, is, uh, Chris is a fellow Rhapsody LPAC member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now we're going to take a quick break to speak with our sponsor. On the show today, we have industry expert and sponsor Hugh Barron, who runs the venture capital practice at global executive search firm 
Armstrong International. Thank you, Hugh, for partnering on the show. Any advice for folks looking to work in venture? Yeah, sure. So um, I would, you know, from uh, from from the people I speak to, um, you know, and, and what I would, you know, I think if you are currently in banking, currently at a startup, uh, what you know, whatever whatever it might be, I think at the end of the day, you know, venture firms invest in technology. Um, you know, most of that um, most of that technology is software based. So if you can find and it's about being authentic. And I think that's that's when I speak to VCs and hiring for VCs on, on the investment side is, you know, authenticated curiosity. You know, so what have you, um, what do you do outside of your day to day that shows that you're passionate about X, Y, or Z? Because that's venture at the end of the day. It's it's 24 seven all consuming industry. And if you don't love it, there are easier ways to make money. That's why, you know, that's why I say to everybody. So, you know, if you're, if you're two years into Goldman, you're three years in consulting or you're, you're, you're whatever startup, just I would say pick two areas you know, it can be food tech, it can be crypto, it can be AI, it can be um, deep tech, whatever, find what you're passionate about. And I think go super deep in those areas. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I'd say is it, it would probably, you know, don't expect it to happen in the next six months. It might take two years. Um, but you just got to prove that and do enjoy it at the end of the day, because it's like I say, it's too hard a job. Um, it's too all consuming for you not to be, not to, um, you know, absolutely love it and want to do it, you know, outside of, outside of your day-to-day um, work. So I think, and, you know, if you can, authenticate, find what you're interested in, authenticate that curiosity, write a blog post, whatever, start a podcast, go on to um, meet founders in your spare time, find what companies you're interested in. If you've got the money, try and angel invest um, in in stuff that you find interesting. Uh, I think that's just, you got to show that you're, you know, you're kind of in it for the, for the long haul, I think. And that will really impress um, most venture firms. I, I I will say the best advice I got breaking into venture with Re- Rebecca Camden said, you can start doing the job when you don't work for a specific fund. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, l- learn how to filter and you can start sending great deals to the people who have been kind enough to take a coffee chat with you. And mm-hmm. you can prove you know how to do the job before before you're in it. So I love that advice Absolutely. that maybe the job comes two years later, but you can actually start doing venture. Uh, you can start sourcing and, and filtering for 20 companies at once, 20 funds at once, because mm-hmm. they haven't got dibs on you yet. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, you know, I do also like the Paul Graham quote, which is like, if you if people go to and say, I want to go into VC, go to a startup first, because if a startup's successful, you might never have to work again and you have invaluable experience to help a founder. So I would also echo that, echo that as well. <laughs> From your perspective, what does venture look like going forward look i think we're in an interesting i think we're in a you know um an interesting spot where i think we're in a a recalibration and and a a restructuring of how venture's been um for the last 20 years which was you know bluntly investing in fintech um you know consumer tech uh and enterprise and and b2b SaaS companies i was coming 80 90 percent of where venture dollars um went i you know I, i do think um you know, with the use of AI, lot building those companies, um, you know, making uh, engineers more efficient is going to come dramatically down. And I, I really hope, you know, venture goes um, back to solving the really, really hard stuff. You know, I'm nothing against 15 minute um, delivery, but if there's more, um, there's more venture dollars that goes into whether it's hardware and, and climate tech, you know, AI and robotics, um, you know, some of the areas of defense tech and aerospace, which I think is super super important um uh globally if we can see more venture dollars just you know risk capital going into solving real problems um i think that's that's where the west where we'll um that's where i hope the next 20 years that's why i think there's going to be some really interesting returns i think uh you know software and SaaS is is um had a great 20 years but it's coming to an end um and the next i hope the next 20 years is, is focused on solving um real real problems of real capital and so um, and, and I was speaking to one fund the other day that said, you know, we'd want 80%, you know, 80, today 80% of our portfolio is is software, 20% is hard tech and, and B2C. And, you know, we'd want, you know, that to be 50-50 over the next, um, over the next five to 10 years. So I definitely think we, I, I think we're seeing a recalibration. I think we're seeing a restructuring. Um, and I, and I hope we can kind of go back to solving real problems, but also, that 500 million, 600 million, 700 million exit is a, is a good exit. And that there's um, a view that liquidity is so important for this industry. And if we don't get liquidity, it's, you know, ev- everything dies. If we don't, M&A needs to reopen. 
um, uh, for companies. And if that can get off the ground and there can be kind of a recalibration that's not all about just building, um, you know, an unprofitable unicorn, um, I think that could be, you know, really, really exciting and make, you know, the next 20 years um, super interesting for venture. Yeah, I, I can see solving big major problems mm-hmm. is also probably quite helpful for recruiting the best talent Thanks. to this industry yeah, that, that you have real you you have a real mission in the work that you're doing you you are such a good partner to have in venture thank you for folks who are interested in working with you and armstrong international feel free to email qb at armstrongint.com and now back to our lp interview one thing we hear a lot of and even our experience within kind of booking this show is it's really hard to find family offices. <laughs> uh, what advice do you give to emerging managers of even getting into this world and finding family offices? The advice I give is try to get an introduction. Try to get a, a warm intro. And so if you think that I'm somebody you want to be introduced to as an example, you look in your LinkedIn and you see who you and I have in common. Santosh is an example. And so you ask Santosh, can you make it, can you make an intro to Eric? Um, that's sort of the best way, uh, a way to learn who they are. Talk to other GPs who are your friends and say, who are some of your helpful LPs? Who are some of your LPs? You know, uh, you don't have to ask them for the intro. You could make they could, you could, depends on your relationship with that GP, but try to learn who those, uh, who those are. Uh, a conference that I think is hands down the best emerging manager VC conference out there called Raise. I'm on their selection committee. Uh, but uh, that's a great, we had this year 100 GPs and it's a selection. So uh, out of like 650 applicants. But 100 GPs and 200 LPs in the room. Mm. And so that's a um, going to a conference like that or other conferences are are great ways to do it. But and and then lastly, I would say is ask your LPs for introductions. Say, all right, who are, you know, can you introduce me to a couple of people in your network that you think might be interested in, in me? It's hard to ask somebody who hasn't invested. So people, I, people ask me all the time, uh, well, can you make an introduction for me to either your friends or to this particular person? And if I have an invested capital, I'm generally, generally, the very rare exceptions, but generally the answer is I just can't do that. My best intros come from other LPs, but where they've invested, but particularly fund of funds and university endowments. And so I have really good relationships with a number of fund of funds and university endowments. Uh, we trade ideas all the time. Um, we compare our diligence notes all the time. Uh, I really respect, it's not that I don't respect family offices and their um, diligence process, but if they're going to spend 10 or 15% of their time and it's just a person, in a space, whereas a fund of funds has a full staff of people, 100% of their time is spent in the space, and they see everything out there, they're going to be a more reliable intro for me than you know some family office that I trade notes with from time to time. So is the, this just makes me think of it. So is the answer for family offices that haven't really institutionalized, is it to rely on consulting firms? So- I mean, you asked the question a, a while back about, you know, if you're an allocator, what can you do? So investing in a an outstanding fund of funds uh, like Sandana or Industry yeah. Ventures or someone like that, they are really good at introducing their LPs to their GPs. And so that's a great way to start, to really get immersed in mm. the ecosystem, to sort of avoid a lot of mistakes. Because there are thousands of emerging VC managers. And so like, how are you going to get introduced to them? And how are you going to evaluate them? That's just hard. So I, I'd say that's a, um, that's, a, that's a great way to do it. If you could otherwise find somebody who's immersed in the ecosystem who will make introductions for you, um, that's great. Uh, but that's hard to find. 
So uh, consultants, fund to funds, those are, are, those are, I think, ways to sort of get in and, and try to figure out. Now, once you're there, like you go in an, an AGM and you meet people, like you meet me and you, 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 know, you, you strike up a friendship. Well, sure, you can then get introduced that way. Or you meet mm-hmm. other LPs at Raise, and you can meet people that way. And so there are ways to get there without having to pay the fees, but you can shortcut a lot and get really high quality by getting a Sindana or an Industry Ventures or Stepstone um, portfolio. Was there ever an introduction and and uh, to a fund manager where you weren't so sure about the strategy, but over time you got to cultivate a relationship, and then you finally pull, you know? pull the trigger and, and invest it? Oh, yeah. All, all the time. So um, as an example, yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, Jewel Ventures uh, focuses on pre-seed and seed is- Israeli deep tech. And I was introduced to the GP from by Samir Kaji, uh, who's a friend. And I uh, had a meeting with uh, Daniel, one of the GPs. And I said, all right, I, um, like what you're doing, seem like a nice guy, but I'm not investing. And here are the reasons why. And, but I'm happy to continue to help you. And I do this not just, not infrequently. So of the 45 or 50 GP venture GPs I'm currently invested with, probably a quarter of them have followed this story. Um, where I say, I, 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 I want to help. Uh, I like what you're doing. And then over six months, a year, sometimes I pass on that fund and it's back to the next fund. Um, so I pass on fund two, I invest in fund three. I pass in fund one, I invest in fund two. Anyway, back to Daniel. So I kept working with Daniel. And uh, every time I made a suggestion, he listened. He either pushed back and said, this is why that doesn't make sense. And I was persuaded by him. Or he said, That's, this really does make sense. And he, he did it. And through the course of that, I got to work through all of the things that I wasn't sure about. Mm-hmm. Because those, because I, I presented it as in, well, I think the world will, the, the LP world will care about this. And this is a problem. And lo and behold, there, you know, I came out and I'm like, I should do this. This is crazy. Why am I not doing this? And so I did. And it's been a fantastic investment. Um, I'm on their LPAC as well. I'm on 12 LPACs. And so it varies. Wow. In terms of what else, what LPACs do. But the best LPACs are comprised primarily of the LPs that they really want to retain for the future. And they then have a cadence every twice a year, three times a year. Maybe it's only once a year, but it's in person at the AGM. They have a cadence where they bring the LPAC in and they ask and they provide information at a level that they can't really provide to other LPs. It's not that if other LPs wanted that information, they wouldn't provide it. Of course they would. They'd be transparent. But they make a point of talking to their LPAC about the companies that have challenges, the companies that are likely to break out, about what they're seeing in terms of valuations, about deal flow, about expanding the team. And it's a real conversation where they're listening to their LPAC and they're providing transparency to their LPAC. When that happens, LPACs are LPAC members are much more likely to understand when things aren't all, aren't going right. And I will guarantee you, a hundred percent of the time in the asset management business, in every asset class, there are periods of underperformance for every single asset manager, always. And what you want and what you don't want is for the, in the venture space is for that to coincide with the time in which you're going to market. Mm-hmm. And if you're, and because what you really want is you don't want to churn your LPs, your easiest LPs to get are the ones that you currently have. And so you have to do everything you can. And, and by the way, your LPAC members are the ones who carry the most, um, the most influence 
over um, other LPs, uh, and they're and they're returning. And so you want to make sure they come back, and you and they're more likely to come back if they feel like they're part of the team, if they're part of the decision making, if they understand where how we got to where we got to. One that sort of comes up more more frequently these days is how um, is your follow on strategy. Where are you going to allocate your follow on dollars? And I have a very strong opinion as to where to allocate it. And we talked about the ZERP period. And I think that the ZERP period creates massive opportunity for seed stage funds who have reserved a reasonable amount of capital. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to divide the world into four tiers of companies. Tier one companies, and there are fewer of those because of um, their, because of the ZERP world. Um, but tier one companies are growing like gangbusters with great um, metrics. There are fewer of those because customers are not buying as quickly. But what you're really trying for is this true product market fit. There is really, that's a need to, not a want to in terms of uh, the product. Okay, there's tier one. There's tier two, which is they're still growing nicely. There's that's a need to for most customers, but they're not growing. Um, they're not just sort of flying off the page, but they're growing nicely. Let's say fifty percent per annum, reasonable customer metrics. Some things have to be fixed still. They still really need capital. Tier three companies, there's something kind of wrong. You haven't mm. really found product market fit yet. They're just not growing as quickly. This churn, the expenses are higher, CAC is higher, whatever it is. And there's tier four companies. They just, they suck. They're just not that good. Um, yeah. They're they're living dead. Tier four companies never got funded in any environment as follow on. They get funded initially, of course. Tier three companies in the ZERP world, they all got funded at mm. really nice valuations. And some of those will end up succeeding. Because again, this is all about a probability. This is not a, it's a 0% probability that tier three is going to succeed and 100% probability that tier one is going to succeed. Mm. It's just when you're an investor, you have to think about what is the probability that my capital is going to return the, uh, is going to return the fund. Because without a return the funder, um, is it worth putting your capital in? And I'd say probably not. Now, follow on capital is a little bit different, but is it going to really drive the, drive so that the aggregate of the investment in that company will return the fund? So what I have, what is great for seed stage managers now is tier two companies have been on sale for the last year, year and a half. That these are companies that would have done their A, and instead you could do a seed extension at a flat to slightly up rent. Mm. And you could allow those companies, and, and the reason is because those companies need to stay alive till 25. Um, but they, they really need to stay alive until capital really starts flowing better. So they need that capital they are still doing really well. They are capital efficient, but they don't want to do a large dilutive round, number one, or number two, they can't because mm -hmm. the, the graduation rate from C to A, and then of course from A to B, has rose dramatically into ZERP and has now come back to normal. What people don't understand is we're now back at normal. We're not at Below, significantly below normal. We're at normal in terms of graduation rates. Anyway, so tier two companies are on sale. That's the best place to put your capital. Mm. Tier three companies. Well, if all you've got is tier three companies, well, that's not so good for you, but you should follow on into your tier three companies because you don't have any tier two companies. But the you asked about the LPAC and what we're talking, what are some interesting conversations at LPACs? The interesting conversation is, Okay, GPs, tell me why, which of your companies are tier two, which are tier three, and why are these the tier two, and why are these the tier three, and how are you, both in terms of your time and your capital, because time is also 
a critical resource. How are you allocating time and capital to lean into those realities? It's been a tough time or just unprecedented times over the last couple of years. Eric, any kind of parting words to our emerging managers? It's a really long business. It takes forever to for fund one to get into the carry before you get into fund two and fund three and the like. And so it takes real persistence and grit. And that only comes from having passion. Mm. If you are not passionate about what you're doing, it's too easy to get off of the train. Mm. And so what I would say to those who are not passionate is that maybe it's not the right fit. And to those who are, buckle up because it's going to continue to be a winding and difficult road. There are just going to be new challenges coming forward. Coming out of the last set of challenges will make you stronger for the next set. Thanks, Eric. All right, take care. See you later, alligator. After portfolio tile, investing with a smile. <laughs>